And it's finally time that we put down the sanding blocks and pick up the rest of the tools as we start playing with the engines. In today's video, I'm going to explain exactly what engine is going in the green Toyota Supra, and I will explain what is happening with the target top on the hoist. But before we do that, let's quickly rewind the tape. Supra people are gonna hate me by the end of this rebuild series. This car is purely to piss off the purists. Like, that's what we're aiming for. So yes, the initial idea was to piss off the purists and put an engine that wasn't a 2JZ in this Supra, but since then plans have definitely shifted and if you don't care about the explanation why I never went through with the Ford Barra, skip to minute whatever it says on the screen, but for the people that want to know, let's get into it. So the Ford Barra is actually an engine that was designed and built here in Australia, came in a variety of cars from taxis to SUVs and also performance Ford Falcons. So we had them in LPG or gas form, non-turbo, turbo, and obviously the engine had many revisions across the time it was being built. It's an inline six, so just like an RB or a 2JZ, but it's got four liters of displacement, meaning that it is a longer engine and also a taller engine, which was our biggest issue when trying to get it into this Toyota Supra. But the reason why I wanted a Barra was for a few reasons. I wanted something that was going to go fast down the quarter mile because quarter mile racing and anything horsepower related seems to do very well in the internet. If I'm already trying to grow this YouTube channel or provide entertainment, obviously horsepower is what people want to see. And the Ford Barra is a very cheap and easy way of doing it and also gets the internet talking. He put a Ford engine in a Toyota Supra. As you know by now, the Toyota Supra, the purest community, won't take that anything else than their perfect or their God's motor being the 2JZ. So, moving on. It is a dual overhead cam, the Ford Barra, and I'm also pretty sure it's got dual VCT. I could have used the factory ECU for well over a thousand horsepower. Rob from Monster Talk here in Western Australia has tuned them past a thousand horsepower with the factory ECUs. They are already factory drive by wire and map sensor, which is also a great thing. The hot side and the cold side I would have thrown in the bin and replaced with aftermarket components for the sake of the visual appearance of the engine bay and also the practical reasons of making more horsepower. The transmission I would have kept at the factory six speed automatic. That's it. Now how much did this drivetrain actually cost me? I bought an entire car for $3,000, sold the shell for 500 bucks and I was left with a turbo engine, gearbox, all accessories, hot side, cold side, ECU, and everything else that comes with it for two and a half thousand dollars. So when you do take into consideration that I have to put a Haltech in this car now, or a Link, or something on the lines of that, that ECU is going to cost me about two to two and a half thousand dollars, and I had an entire drivetrain there for two and a half thousand dollars with the ECU that's reflashable for the horsepower levels that we want to see. This car would have been deep into the nine seconds, no problem. Probably not on a stock motor, but it would have seen nine seconds on a stock motor, high nines, with the factory transmission as long as it could have lasted before we would have had to upgrade the internals in it. Now, one of the reasons I steered away from it was the actual complexity of getting the engine in the engine bay. The length was never the problem, but the height was. The Toyota Supra engine bay, the only engine that was ever supposed to go in that car was the 2JZ, and the way the cross members are set up, you have your front cross member with your steering rack on it, and then you have like another cross member, or also known as the suspension pickup point slash brace in the car. So they were our biggest issues with trying to get this engine in there. The steering rack was the biggest problem and if we relocated the steering rack it would have stuffed around with the actual suspension geometry and if we lowered the cross members to give us more height or more clearance that also would have stuffed around with the suspension geometry which I didn't really want to do. Safety is my number one priority at the end of the day and engineering the car and making sure that it's road legal and if I spaced it out to the point where it's you know 25 to 30 millimeters I don't think this car would have ever been engineered nobody would ever pass that. So they were my biggest concerns. Now if we went dry sump or still a wet sump with an external oil pump, that could have worked. But 
that's a huge added cost and it sort of defeats the purpose of putting a barra in the car instead let's just do the cookie cutter recipe and keep it to jay-z but with our own little spin on it to still keep it relatively budget friendly so somebody actually left a comment on the Dartone racing video where i went through the entire workshop with anthony we spent 40 minutes talking skylines gdrs into a lot of detail and somebody said why don't you do the exact style of video with Rob from Monster Talk here in Western Australia, but instead you talk barrows, ZF transmissions, and everything else in between. So I might hit up Rob, see if he's interested, because it would definitely make for an interesting video for it to further explain why I really wanted a Ford Barrow in this car, but in the long run, it wasn't really a feasible option. And also the resale value of the vehicle would probably never be as high with a Barrow in it compared to a 2JZ, which is something that we also always need to consider with each project as these cars are getting very expensive and they are to the point where they are considered investments. So here we go, this is the engine I'll be using in the green Toyota Supra, it is coming out of my dad's 1993 Mark IV Supra which is actually a target top, naturally aspirated and automatic which can only mean one thing, 2JZ GE non VVTi. So I can already hear the questions coming in, in the left corner we've got the guys that are new to the YouTube channel that might have just stumbled across this Supra rebuild series and they're asking themselves well you've gone through all this effort to rebuild this shell and now you're putting a naturally aspirated engine in it what are you doing wrong while in the right corner we've got the boys that have been following for a while now that might be asking themselves well what is the reasoning behind choosing a naturally aspirated engine once again just like you've done in your r34 skyline you know you weren't happy with that so how is this going to be any different and also why the hell are you taking apart your dad's perfectly running and driving toyota supra to build your own both are great questions, but I'll start off with the actual car, a bit of a history behind it and how we got to it. So looking at my actual photos I dug through, this car was purchased on the 28th of November 2020, and today is the 22nd of November 2021. So we've had the car for just under 12 months, and it's gone from a running and driving car to a completely nearly stripped shell. So now to the actual story of how we got to it. The phone rings, goes a ding a ding ding, it's the motherfucking thing. Tristan, WTF. And I was like, what have I left at his? What have I broken in his workshop? But it turns out he had a Toyota Supra that he didn't really want. And he offered it to us before putting it up for sale. It was a deal that we simply could not refuse. And I just want to give a massive thank you to Tristan for actually reaching out to us first. There's a link in the description below to his YouTube channel. We both know that if he listed this car up for sale on Marketplace or Gumtree that same day, it would have sold for an extra five to $7,000, I'd say, over his asking price. So him actually reaching out to us is much appreciated. Now, I'm sure he thought it's going to a good home, it's gonna get restored, and it will one day, but just not just yet. So now to the actual thought process of pulling apart a complete target top and using its parts to finish off the target top. So before the project even started, I looked at the two cars, the two Supras, and I said, which one am I starting on first, and which one is going to stay in the family for an extended period of time? And the target top was the one that was gonna stay in the family for longer, and the the hard top was the one that was very sad looking and really needed attention ASAP. And it was also the more difficult project in my opinion. So, started off with the target top, gave the body a full restoration, and now we are at the point where this car needs a significant amount of money for the project to actually continue. And as you guys know, money doesn't grow on trees, we're not millionaires, even though it might seem like we've got a million projects going on. What's gonna happen is the target top is going to donate as many parts as the hard top might need for that project to get complete. Once the green car is completed, I want to travel Australia in it because that will be the first car that is completed and also want to film content that is out of the workshop for once. Enjoy the car for what it is and then as we are approaching the end of our second project, which will probably be my blue R34 Skyline, I will probably part ways with the Toyota Supra and put the funds towards the target top. I hope that makes sense to people. I know there's a lot of going on, there's a lot of projects going on, but I'm just trying to make the most of the resources we have available. And a lot of these parts that are actually coming off the target top can still be purchased brand new through Toyota for a very reasonable price. So we're not really missing out on anything. At the end of the day, we are going to end up with two very quality cars that are very different builds. Now, whether the target top receives a V12 or a brand new 2JZ, 
time will tell along with the budget but for now we are just chipping away as we go and using the parts we have available to us. All right, so I just had a shower and the engine got a little bit of water on it as well. And um, yeah, she's looking a lot better than what it did. Look at that. Not bad at all. Next up, get the car off the lift and give the engine bay a good run. Uh, wash, rinse, wash. Fucking English, my English.
good as it is. All right, so I'm visiting the boys over here at Quick Shift TV, aka WTL Photo. Yeah, Tristan just is going to teach me how to make a transmission mount and the correct angles between the back of the transmission and the diff, just so when I order my tail shaft, we're not on like a crazy angle or like a st straight plane. Instead, he will explain what needs to be done. But before we do that, um, we've got some billety billets to look at. And I'll give you all the time in the world to talk about that. Now? Yes. Okay, billet intake manifold. I've got lots of billets. I mean, I don't really need to say anything. Just look at it, it's shiny. It's got titanium in it. Does it? Yeah, it does. What else? What else have you done since we've last seen you? Well, you know, this used to be all 3D printed, right? So most people have seen like the, the 3D printed version of the manifold. So I got them made out of metal, which is exciting yep. because it means it can actually work, but it can't work because the, the engine is not built. What else have you done? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I've made a thermostat housing. And, oh, we've um, got a crank pulley this time as well. Oh yeah, crank pulley, and look, look, look. There you go, the crank pulley is for the oil pump. And I made a tensioner, so the oil pump can, like, tension. So you've made three parts in 12 months. Uh, yeah, so it sort of seems like that. <laughs> <laughs> but they're complicated parts. Look, I had to learn how to make parts before I could make the parts. It takes time. Yeah, these are all prototypes. So it's like, prototype, 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 change the design, try something else, that didn't work. And you eventually end up with something that kind of fits and works. So, well, I know you've got a couple of Supras, right? Yeah. Do you want a V12? Yes. Okay, so there's going to be more V12 Supras? Yep, in um, WA. What about all the billets? Yeah, I'm pretty interested. I yeah. think the viewers are as well. Do you have a house? <laughs> to sell it to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no I won't lie these cost a lot of money to make yeah but um hey we'll talk good anyway tail shaft alright tail shaft here. yep right. let's, let's go up let's not get distracted Right, so I've got this uh, drive shaft for dummies. Yeah, you can put that up on the screen. You've got your, your engine angle and your diff angle, right? And you can see these lines, these planes, they gotta be in the same direction. So what you're looking to do, so once you've jacked the transmission up to the point where it's parallel to the diff, what you wanna do is measure the transmission to the tail shaft and that angle there should be one to three degrees. And then at the other end, at the diff, there, that, We'll also have an angle and that should be one to three degrees and they should be about the same angle. If you've got that, win it. So here we go, these are the flanges that the drive shaft bolts up to. So we've got one on the transmission and we've also got one on the differential. As mentioned by Tristan, we are aiming for that one degree difference and as you can see on the back of the flange of the transmission we've got 84.6 and on the flange of the differential we've got roughly 85.6.7 so we are within spec. And I know what you're thinking, I'm using an iPhone to get this measurement but we did compare my iPhone 12 Max to Tristan's Bosch measuring device and the results were the exact same so instead of spending money on a measuring device that I'm going to use once in a blue moon, I figured I'd just use my iPhone as it is accurate. Just make sure that the actual volume up and down buttons along with the lock button do not touch the actual flanges because that will interfere with your measurement. So this is actually my first ever transmission mount that I've made and I made a silly mistake by trusting the second hand rubber bush. So whether you go solid bush, polyurethane, whatever it might be, make sure you get a brand new one. You're going to get one anyway so you might as well fabricate the car with the appropriate one. 
This one was actually stuffed up and it was on a completely different angle. So the first time I made this transmission mount, as you can see, the angle of it was completely off. So I ended up remaking one that was a little bit better designed, but again, nothing too crazy and it's not the best looking transmission mount out there, but it'll definitely hold. Not the best welds, but they'll definitely do. So we are approaching the end of another video and as you can see the Black Supra now has a drivetrain in it which we'll simply use for fabrication purposes, pull it out, clean it up and then slip it back into the green cart for the final time. In next week's video, it's a massive episode, about 30-35 minutes, I explain why I decided to buy a brand new GT cylinder head along with the turbo kit used and all the other components that will be going on the car. So that video is completely edited and finalized, ready to go live seven days after this video goes up online. So that'll be a very nice episode. And then after that, we are jumping straight into the intercooler piping fabrication, which has already been complete. The intercooler is on along with all the intercooler piping and where it's time to just continue progressing. Exhaust, fuel system, wiring, finalize the engine and easier said than done, but it'd be pretty cool to have a running car for once. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you.